Hello everyone, it's Peter Dunn here from the Australia at War website. Today I'm going to give a presentation about air defence systems in Australia during World War II. This talk is um, based on a RAAF training film that was issued during the war and is focused on the operations of number three fighter sector headquarters in the Townsville area during World War II. So just bear with me while I share my screen here to show you this PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so this presentation is based, as I said, on a RAF training film. It was titled uh, Alert, and it was narrated by Squadron Leader George McCarter, who was in the Air Staff section of RAF Command, which was located, which was part of General Headquarters Southwest Pacific Area, which was MacArthur's uh, Theatre of Command. And at that time, that unit was located in the AMP building on the corner of Queen and Edward Street. My talk today will cover a number of aspects, including uh, three fighter sector headquarters, um, radi rad radio direction finding, or radar as it was later known, and I'll also talk about direction finding stations, or DF stations. I'll talk about the Volunteer Air Observers Corps, which was the VAOC. I'll talk about air raid precautions, um, anti-aircraft batteries that operated in the area, and searchlight batteries. And at the end, I'll wrap it up uh, with a discussion on the three Japanese air raids that occurred on Townsville during World War II. What you see here is an overall model of the air defence arrangements in Australia in 1942. It was based largely on the British system of air defence. Um, I'll let you have a look at that for a little while, and I'll, I'll go through this in detail uh, shortly. But the centre of um, the whole operation was the three fighter sector operations room that you can see uh, just here. So the air defence system is divided in two phases. Aircraft movements over land, on the left at the top there, and aircraft movements over sea. The aircraft movements over sea were detected um, by using radar and direction finding stations. And I'll talk a little bit about those now. RDF or radar stations sent out an active pulse which bounced off the target and was received back at the radar station, allowing it to give a bearing and a distance. Um, and if you were lucky, you could sort of tell roughly how many aircraft there were. Direction finding stations were very different. Uh, you have a look at that diagram there. Um, what they did was they rotated a directional antenna until the strongest signal of the enemy wireless was detected, and they could then determine the location of that enemy wireless by triangulation using at least one other DF station, as you can see in that diagram. Radio direction finding or radar operators could determine the number of aircraft, the height, position and course of the aircraft approaching from the sea. The RAF had a number of radar stations in North Queensland in 1942. Um, I'll just go through some of them. Uh, 26 radar, RAAF, was located at Cape Cleveland where the lighthouse is. It became operational on the 19th of August 1942 and remained there until the end of the war. Uh, number 104 uh, radar, RAAF, which later became 57 radar, moved was formed, should I say, in Townsville on the 1st of June 1942. Initially it was located on Castle Hill for a short while, uh, then relocated to the small hill at Kissing Point, and then moved to a small hill at Belgian Gardens and it was located there from the 20th of October 1943 to the 8th of January 1945. 27 radar, RAAF, was located on Dunk Island and it became operational on the 9th of November 1942. 28 radar was located on Fitzroy Island near Cairns and operated from the 20th of October 1942. 36 radar was on Hammond Island near Thursday Island it operated from the 20th of March 1942 through to the 27th of August 1943. 
So US radar sites, um, Company E of the 565th Signal Aircraft Warning Battalion had an SCR-270 radar site at McClellan's Lookout at Paluma from March 1942 through to October 1943. The 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti-aircraft had six SCR-268 radar sets and later the 197th Coast Artillery Anti-Aircraft had six SCR-268 radar sets for controlling their searchlights. The RAF um, H High Frequency Direction Finding Stations were located at Garbutt, Mongulba, which was 40 miles north of Townsville, Mingala and Brandon for tri triangulation purposes. Here you can see the HF uh, DF station near Garbutt Airfield using ADCOC type high frequency cathode ray direction finding equipment. So if I just go back to the previous slide, that was located in that circle there, just south uh, of Garbutt Airfield, in between the airfield and the large American air depot, which was later built um, in late 1942. From the 2nd of August uh, 1942, the first operating platoon of the 126 Signal Radio Intelligence Company set up 206C DF sites at Townsville, Cairns, Charters Towers and Cloncurry. They worked in conjunction with number one wireless unit RAAF at uh, French Street and Sycamore Streets in Pimlico, not far from where I used to live, and they would obtain bearings on enemy aircraft. 126th SRI company left Townsville for Brisbane on the 15th of November 1942. Number one wireless unit, wireless unit should I say, uh, moved to a new bunker at Stewart on the 16th of September 1942. What you can see in this photo is a typical radio direction finding antenna. Uh, which belonged to the 126 Signal Radio Intelligence Company. This particular aerial and, uh, in this photo was located at Northgate in Brisbane during World War II, later relocated to the Stafford area. Information from RDF stations and direction finding stations was passed on to the filter room, which was part of three fighter sector headquarters at the grammar school in Townsville at North Ward. Radar tracks were passed from the radar operator at Paluma to the plotters in the filter room at three fighter sector headquarters at the Townsville Grammar School. Um, by the way, th these are actual photos um, of, of that American unit and actual photos inside three fighter sector headquarters filter room during World War II at the Grammar School. They're frame grabs from the training video. Um, each plotter in the filter room was in co contact with a separate radar station. So each one of those ladies there on the left uh, was in contact with a separate radar station. So it looks like there were four radar stations. Several radar stations may pick up the same track of aircraft with slight variations. These slightly separate observations were then filtered in the filter room into one track. The teller in the filter room would then pass that filtered track onto the adjacent fighter sector operations room by telephone. Three fighter sector headquarters RAAF was the key to air defence in the Townsville area in 1942. It was established, as I said, in the grammar school at North Ward on the 25th of February 1942. By the end of March 42. There were 30 officers and 115 ordinary ranks attached to three fighter sector headquarters. The headquarters later moved to a new bunker, as I said earlier, at Stewart on the 20th of December 1944. In the operations room, they used a specially gridded map on that large central table that you can see at the right of that photo. Uh, that covered their area of control all aircraft movements over land and sea were plotted. Uh, the maps used by fighter pilots were a smaller scale version of that large table map. 
The controller in the operations room was in communication with fighter aircraft assigned to fighter sector headquarters. The controller uh, directed the fighter aircraft in the in interception of the enemy aircraft and we'll talk about how that happened. The operations officer, you can see in this photo in the middle there, was in communications with the unit operations room for the various units supporting fighter sector headquarters. And you can see the controller uh, to his right. I think that lady there to the left uh, helped the um, operations officer. Here in this photo, you can see the controller uh, standing up was about to confer with the three liaison officers that were attached to fighter sector headquarters. One each for the Volunteer Air Observer Corps, the anti-aircraft, that fellow there is an American from the 208th anti-aircraft, and the Navy um, were used as liaison officers in the operations room. The fighter sector headquarters intelligence officer, you can see uh, again, is seated at the far left there. The enemy aircraft's course was plotted at the interception table, which is in front of those uh, liaison officers. Um, the, the course was computed using a course and speed calculator, which you can see at the bottom right of the photo, uh, which was used to uh, that was used to intercept a uh, intercept the enemy aircraft. Determine a course to intercept the enemy aircraft. On the display board in the operations room, you could see um, meteorological data displayed, which was essential to be able to determine an accurate interception course at that interception table. Aircraft movements over land were observed by the Volunteer Air Observer Corps and VDC, Volunteer Defence Corps post. Joseph Carter, um, the lighthouse keeper at Cape Cleveland was one of those volunteer VAOC observers. The observers would note the direction, number of engines and height of the aircraft and attempt to identify the aircraft if possible. They would, ring, they would then ring the telephone exchange and ask for an air flash call. The operator would then, if necessary, disconnect any current calls to put the call through on an urgent basis to the VAOC centre. Each spotter had their own code name and they would start their call with the words air flash. So as you can see in the photo, these um, field observers um, could be the local farmer, uh, local volunteer ladies, uh, the local policeman, and as I've said, the, the lighthouse keeper and the railway station master. So air flash messages were received at number four VAOC centre in Townsville, which was the main centre that uh, interacted with three fighter sector headquarters. Four VAOC centre was formed in a room at the Townsville Police Headquarters on the 22nd of January 1942. That's the building where I got my motorbike licence. Air flash messages from the VAOC post would be received by the telephone operators at number four VAOC centre in police headquarters. And you can see the ladies there with their own booths and telephone and uh, paperwork, etc. Um, here you can see one of the air flash message forms that were used. In April 1942, four VAOC was receiving more than 200 air flash air flash messages per day and occasionally there would be over 300 messages in a day. So that's quite a lot of sightings in a day. Um, just shows how busy, a lot of them would have been our own aircraft of course, just shows how busy the um, air, air, um, why, air, <laughs> the air th war was in North Queensland. Number four VAOC centre moved to 18 Stewart Street North Ward on the 15th of April 1942. And here you can see a photo of the RAAF personnel that operated out of four VAOC centre. Reports were flashed through by observers, were plotted, sorry I'll start again. Reports flashed through by observers were plotted and passed to three fighter sector headquarters operations room. All allied aircraft movements were signal from all airfields to three fighter sector headquarters. 
um, they were used that that those signals were usually sent uh, using teleprinters from the airfields to fighter sector headquarters and to the VAOC centre as well. They would give the estimated time of departure and arrival and the course and height to be flown by the Allied aircraft. As you can see, there were many airfields in the Townsville area during World War II. That's a photo of the, the original World War II control tower at Garbutt Airfield. Um, you can see the foothills of Mount Stewart in the background there. Um, Kelso was never used, it was built. Uh, that's where they had the um, African-American riot during World War II. Mount St John was pretty close to Garbutt Airfield. So quite a lot of airfields uh, in the Townsville area during World War II. The identification officer, who you can see in this photo, would determine, using the information signal from Allied airfields, whether the plotted tracks appearing on the main table related to movements of our own aircraft or hostile aircraft. If it was determined that the tracks were of enemy aircraft, the fighter sector headquarters operations room passed information out to various locations that you can see highlighted in red uh, on the diagram. So to combine um, initially to the fighter squadrons obviously, uh, to the civil air raid warning uh, setup, the anti-aircraft batteries, intelligence uh, headquarters, the naval officer in charge, which is what NOIC stands for, searchlight batteries, and combined defence headquarters. Various um, USAAF, United States Army Air Force, and RAAF fighter squadrons were allocated to three fighter sector headquarters at various times while they were based in the Townsville area. For example, 35 fighter squadron and 36 fighter squadron USAAF of the 8th fighter group were allocated to three fighter sector headquarters for local air defence on the 7th of April 1942 through to the 26th of April 1942, so only, only a very short while, just under three weeks. In this photo you can see P-39 Aero Cobras of the 39th Fighter Squadron, 35th Fighter Group, being scrambled by three fighter sector headquarters. 76 Squadron RAAF were based at the Aikenvale Weir Airfield, were assigned to three fighter sector headquarters in Townsville from the 15th of April 1942 to the 22nd of July 1942. Um, I found a worrying entry in three fighter sector headquarters operations record book on the 1st of December 1942 where it said, no fighter aircraft available. A few planes of 75 Squadron had been available since November the 16th, but were moved on November the 30th. Uh, in the room they had an aircraft flight status board which displayed on a lighted display board or annunciator um, the status of aircraft whether they were on standby, they were, uh, had left the ground, they were airborne in the last 15 minutes uh, etc. Um, three fighter sector headquarters operations room was the location in the Townsville area responsible for issuing all air raid alerts. Um, so uh, these, the makeup of these alerts did change a little bit, but basically in 1942 there were four levels of air raid alert. There was a yellow, preliminary caution, white, cancel the caution, red, an action warning, uh, which um, started off a air raid signal, was sounded in the in the Townsell area uh, and green uh, was to indicate that the raiders had passed over. Um, early air defence systems in Townsville comprised um, both Australian and American units. The 16th Australian Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery established their first gun site at Palaranda in January 1942. Uh, the American 208th Coast Artillery Regiment Air Aircraft arrived by train in Townsville on the 18th of March 1942 and the 2nd 9th Light Anti-Aircraft battery, battery of the Australian Army arrived in Townsville by train on the 20th of April 1942. 
Here you can see the structure for the American 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti-aircraft. Uh, Battery H, that one at the bottom there, was camped at the South Townsville State School. And there's a plaque at the school. They were there for five months and they've got some memorabilia in one of the rooms. The headquarters battalion for the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment was located at the Central State School in North Ward. I found this plan for a USAFIA command post in Townsville in the National Archives a few years ago. So it says it's a command post in Townsville. But when I looked at it, I realised um, what it was a plan of. Um, it's a plan for this small bunker, which is still there in Townsville and located under the road up, up going up to Castle Hill. Uh, and I believe that was this um, command post on that diagram. And I believe it was probably the command post for the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment. I can't prove it, but, you know, I'm reasonably sure that this, that's what it was. This bunker is hiding in plain sight with uh, most, of, most of the people in Townsville don't even know it's there. You, you more or less drive over it going up Castle Hill. It's got two uh, entrances um, leading into a small room where the command post was. Um, there's an entry here from the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment Journal. Um, it says, Yanks well received by the native population, in brackets Australians, especially the girls, and soon American slang and dancing and other social customs, whatever that means, were in the vogue. Um, weekly dances were held uh, at the AWU Hall in Denham Street in Townsville that the 208th men attended. On the 18th of August, the communications section of Headquarters Battery of the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti-aircraft started to lay a submarine cable to Picnic Bay, which is the first bay that you get to when you travel to Magnetic Island. They also built 3.4 miles of pole lines, timber poles, to Arcadia and 2.6 uh, mile of tree line uh, communications cable to Horseshoe Bay, which is at the top of the island. This replaced a very ineffective radio link, which was used to communicate with the radar and searchlight units on Magnetic Island. The 208th Coast Artillery Regiment remained in tactical positions in Townsville until the 16th of September, 1942. When some of its units were withdrawn and left for Port Moresby on the 15th of October 1942, the 197th Coast Artillery Anti-Aircraft Regiment then took over as the main US unit responsible for anti-aircraft defence of the Townsville area. Um, some of the other anti-aircraft units that were in the Townsville area in 1942, you can see listed here. I'm not sure that they actually set up um, operational positions. Um, some of them may have, but they may have just been transiting uh, through on their way north. So I won't go into any detail there. Uh, here you can see um, a three-inch gun, an American gun, at Ross River uh, site. So this is just south of the Ross River um, in Townsville and they're actually firing a live round. So they they had um, sandbag sites, um, gun stations. Um, here you can see the sandbag sites for the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment on the southern side of Ross River with Castle Hill um, prominent at the right of the photo. There were a number of uh, Japanese reconnaissance flights over Townsville during World War II. The first one was actually in March 1942, and there were a number in May. Um, Battery C of the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti aircraft, based at this site here at Anumba, fired on two Japanese reconnaissance aircraft on the 1st of May 1942. This is an interesting photo. I saw this photo many years ago and never took much notice of it until a few years later I finally realised where this photo was taken. It was actually taken in my school ground that I attended in Townsville 
1965 and 1966. I went to Our Lady's Mount Christian Brothers College on Stanton Hill in Townsville. And if you have a closer look at the photo, um, when I had a closer look, I realised that the, the hills you can see, which are a bit darker here in the background, was Cape Cleveland. And below it, you can just sort of see smudgy outlines with a, a linear thing here, linear line, a straight line. Um, and that's the, the port, the Townsville Harbour, um, with the western breakwater, is that line. And then I realised um, that this roof line here was the... Because I knew that there had been anti-aircraft, an American anti-aircraft battery at our school, I then realised that that roof line was our combined tuck shop and shade shelter at our school. And you can see one of the three-inch guns here, uh, and this is all camouflage netting. There'll be uh, three other guns under here and somewhere possibly uh, over to the right, I'm, I'm guessing, a, a radar unit as well, which was probably um, camouflaged as well. So here's an aerial shot of the school. I, I, I can't remember what year this was. It's a very early photo, though. Um, this was our main um, school building. Um, the building I was in was built much later and it was sort of located here uh, and here's that combined tuck shop and shade shelter so all the guns and the radar were on our parade ground which is here so there were four three inch guns of battery D of the 208th um, Coast Artillery Anti-Aircraft Regiment and there's another shot of one of the guns sticking up um, and our tuck shop and shade shelter at the left there uh, here's some men uh, building their emplacement for their 50 calibre gun at Mount St John. That's 1st Platoon of Battery E of the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment. And here you can see Private Sid Stocking of that same uh, platoon um, manning a 50 calibre machine gun at Mount St John after they'd finished building their uh, enclosure. Men of the uh, 208th Coast Artillery Regiment here on parade. Um, at Queen's Park, I think that is, at North Ward with Castle Hill there in the background. Here you can see um, four 40mm Bofors guns located on some earthworks uh, that were being built for land reclamation purposes in Townsville Harbour. And you can see the, um, the western breakwater in the background and that's pa the Palaranda area at the back there. So there's four guns. There's one you can clearly see, two, three and four. And again they were heavily camouflaged as well. And you can see here's that, um, that wall, uh, stone wall that they were located on to reclaim this land. Um, the, there were these locations here that you can see were locations for the Australian Army's heavy anti-aircraft gun stations in Townsville in 1942. I've sort of shown in grey what came a bit later. The command post for these guns was erected by the Queensland Main Roads Commission at Jimmy's Lookout, um, just um, beside the Belgian Garden Cemetery. Um, Defence, arrange, defence arrangements in Townsville required that all Allied aircraft had to enter the Townsville restricted area by a specified lane of entry, and I believe that was coming over um, Magnetic Island. On the 28th of March 1942, both RAAF and USAAF units uh, were reminded uh, of these arrangements by the General Officer Commanding Northern Command. And the reason that he gave this reminder was uh, there had been two recent occasions where the Australian Army's 16th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery had opened fire on friendly aircraft which had not used that nominated lane of entry into the Townsville airspace. Here I've uh, overlaid a March 1942 photo of the 394th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Gun Station at Pelaranda over the top of a frame grab of a 2000, year 2000 aerial photo from Google Earth. Um, 
and you can see here the four 3.7 inch gun sights, two, three, four, and the command post and predictor, etc., in the centre and the camp and um, <clears throat> other buildings at the bottom there. So this is what's there today. Uh, this is an old aerial photo, of course. That's now the Garden Settlement uh, Retirement Village. Here you can see two of the four 3.7 inch guns of the 395th Australian Army Heavy Anti-Aircraft Gun Station. Um, located, if they were there today, they'd be in the middle of Strand Park. And you can see um, the harbour in the background with a number of ships in, in port there. On this map, um, sorry, this aerial photo, I've um, highlighted the heavy gun, um, heavy anti-aircraft gun locations um, that were in the Townsend area in, in about August 1942. So the purple locations are the Australian 3.7 inch heavy anti-aircraft anti gun sites at Pelaranda and Mount St John. And the yellow locations are the American 3 inch gun sites at my school, Our Ladies Mount, at Ross River, on the southern side of the Ross River, and a Noomba. <clears throat> this slide shows the locations of the American searchlights units in about August 1942. And as you can see, there's quite a few of them uh, going right out to Alligator Creek Meat Meatworks and out to Roseneath. There was one near today's Korea Zinc uh, establishment and a number of others. And here are the American searchlights that were located on Magne Magnetic Island in about August 1942. So there was one at West Point, near Bolger Bay, Horseshoe Bay, between Arthur Bay and Arcadia, and one at Nally Bay. And here are the American radar locations in the Townsville area, one at my school, Ross River, Anoomba, and Alligator Creek Meatworks. By the way, those radars actually controlled the anti-aircraft guns, so they helped aim the gun at the enemy aircraft. And here is the single American radar at Horseshoe Bay on Magnetic Island. So you can see um, a, a picture there of the type of radar, which was an SCR-268. At the left um, in this uh, series of photos is an M2 sound locator which was used to pick up the sound of aircraft engines, particularly at night time. It was rotated up and down until they measured the loud, loudest sound from the two vertical sensors. So here are the two vertical sensors. And then move left to right to measure the loudest sound from the two horizontal sensors, so those two here. So pretty crude but reasonably effective particularly at night. In the photo at the right, uh, they were testing binoculars which were electrically coupled to a searchlight. So um, wherever the fellow pointed the binoculars, it moved the searchlight to that location. Pretty high tech, I guess, for the, that time, that era. 15 searchlights of Battery E, 94th Coast Artillery Regiment Anti-Aircraft moved to the Townsville area on the 13th of September 1942 after the 208th moved out. The 2nd Platoon Headquarters and four sections of searchlights for the 94th moved to Magnetic Island on the 15th of September 1942. One searchlight section set itself up near the start of the Horseshoe Bay jetty uh, but the position of the light later moved a number of times but ended up at the end of the jetty and um, once they realised that was the best location. The other three sections of searchlights were scattered around the island. The second ninth light anti-aircraft battery of the Australian Army arrived in Townsville by train on the 20th of April 1942. Arrival was unexpected and they were finally dumped in a timbered paddock near Jimmy's lookout. They had no tents, no water and no amenities, but lots of mosquitoes. On the 21st of April 1942, the next day, the battery commander reported to Colonel Dolson, the commanding officer of the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment, because they were in control 
of overall anti-aircraft um, and searchlight operations in the Townsville area. On the 22nd of April, the 2nd 9th relocated to Garbutt Airfield to provide light anti-aircraft events for the airfield. That unit was relieved by the 32nd Light Anti-Aircraft in June 1942, again an Australian Army unit. Prior to September 1942, Australian anti-aircraft defences were under the command of US forces and limited Australian units were deployed. In September 1942, Headquarters Anti-Aircraft Group uh, North Queensland of the Australian Army was formed in Townsville. It took command um, of the Anti-Aircraft Operations Room, previously uh, called the Gun Operations Room, at 7 Paxton Street, North Ward. The 16th Australian Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery, and they also took administ administrative control of Australian units at Cairns, which was the 223rd Light Anti-Aircraft Battery and the 64th Anti-Aircraft Searchlight Company, and two units at Mariba, the 37th Anti-Aircraft Battery and the 224th Light Anti-Aircraft anti Battery. In the Townsville area, the Chief Air Ward Warden was Mr James C. Butler. Dr Les Helberstater, uh, the Government Medical Officer, who also happened to be our family doctor uh, when I was a kid, was also heavily involved in air raid precautions arrangements. There were 900 ARP wardens in the Townsville area in January 1942 and 1,200 wardens by March 1942. ARP responsibilities, that's air raid precautions responsibilities, were divided into zones, with each zone having its own casualty clearing station or first aid post. A total of 103 AR posts were created. Um, in this slide you can see a picture of an air raid siren um, and um, some details on uh, the type of noises that um, came out of those for the various air raid alerts. So the preliminary was a series of short blasts, um, an air raid was a continuous sound having a varying pitch, uh, de described as a wailing signal and the all clear was a continuous sound of constant pitch. Um, there were a number of air raid shelters built in the middle of Flinders Street, uh, which was the main street of Townsville. Here you can see one um, outside of the Carol's, which was a Carol's uh, shop, which was a, uh, a clothing shop in Townsville uh, when I was a boy. Um, a blackout trial was held in all, all eastern state, states of Australia on the 11th of February 1942. Uh, it was witnessed by seven officers of the 31st Battalion Australian Army from the top of Castle Hill. Unfortunately, it was only partially successful. The harbour lights were left on for 20 minutes after the air raid siren was sounded and 12 other isolated lights stayed on across the city. And unfortunately, the lighthouse beacons at Cape Cleveland and Bay Rock also stayed on during the, um, the blackout trial. There were many um, conflicting and confusing records about the three air raids that were uh, carried out by the Japanese on Townsville. One reference um, even suggested there were four air raids. There was also confusion about the number and type of aircraft and the number of bombs dropped and also the time that they happened. And this confusion with time was brought about by official records um, using different time zones. Um, some official records were in Z time or Zulu time, which was Greenwich Mean Time, so UTC plus or minus zero. And some records were in K time or Kilo time which is UTC plus 10 hours, which was local time for Townsville. So, and other records were in a different time zone. So it created a lot of confusion for historians um, later on. Uh, even the Townsville newspapers were confused. Uh, um, so here's a article about the first air raid on Townsville and they say that there were four planes engaged. There, there were only two. Um, so never believe what you read in the papers. So two Emily flying boats, uh, serial numbers W45 and W46, piloted by Lieutenant 
Asai, A-S-A-I, and Lieutenant Kayoshi Mizukuru left Rabaul uh, at 4.18pm on, on Saturday the 28, 25th, should I say, of July 1942. Number wire, one wireless unit, RAAF, uh, located at 24 French Street, heard the Japanese pilot's radio transmission on their AR-7 radio sets they had in the house there at French Street as the aircraft took off from a ball. One wireless unit then caught contacted the RAAF direction finding stations and asked them to get a bearing on the next Japanese radio transmission. Um, just um, These were probably Morse code transmissions, by the way. Some records have incorrectly stated that the Japanese raiders were Mavis Type 97 Kawanishi flying boats. They were, in fact, Emily flying boats. The initial transmission started with the name of their base uh, and the call sign for their aircraft. One wireless unit was able to identify their base as Rabaul and their next, text, their next message that they sent out went along the lines of can you hear me and what signal strength and that was sent out in Kana Morse code, Katakana Morse code. It was initially thought that they were on a raid to Port Moresby or Milne Bay. Rabaul uh, at the time was headquarters for the 14th Yokosuka Air Group and their four-engined H8K2 Kawanishi Emily flying boats. The direction finding stations were able to monitor stronger signals and their plots indicated that the aircraft were on their way to Townsall. They advised the operations group at Townsall that the estimated arrival time was 11.30pm. Remember that time, 11.30pm. Operations group, however, knew better, so at least they thought they did, and chose to rely on the radar stations that were under their control to get position of these Japanese aircraft. The two enemy aircraft arrived from the northeast over Townsville at 11.30 p.m. unopposed. The harbour and the city lights were still blazing at the time they arrived. They circled the town for 30 minutes um, and then flew out to sea over Cape Cleveland after four searchlights finally illuminated them. The 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti-aircraft guns were not used on the orders from the Air Defence Commander. I believe he got into trouble the next day. The two MLEs returned again at 12.40am and dropped 15 240 kilogram bombs 400 yards east of the oil tanks at town, near Townsville Harbour. Only six bombs were sighted by those on the ground. Um, HMAS Swan, uh, SS Burwa and SS Bantam were docked in the Townsville Harbour at the time of the raid. Uh, one wireless unit monitored enemy radio traffic as the two aircraft landed at Rabaul at 7.12am on the following morning, Sunday the 26th of July 1942. So here you can see where those bombs landed near those oil tanks, uh, not far from the, uh, the harbour. And you can see those three ships uh, parked there as well. Um, in this photo, you can see Army personnel uh, looking for unexploded bombs and any large pieces of shrapnel to uh, get some intelligence from them if they could. Bob, the late Bob Piper, and uh, his book, indicated that there were two aircraft. And um, Bob was a very detailed researcher and he proved to be correct. Three fighter sector headquarters uh, itself reported five unidentified aircraft approaching from the north northeast. However, Bob's research was based on Japanese um, records of the, that particular air raid. The 208th Coast Artillery Regiment anti aircraft reported three aircraft. The 31st Battalion War Diary stated there were three aircraft. Civilian Defence Headquarters reported a Captain Scott seeing two flights of three aircraft. That is six aircraft. So, as you can see, quite a lot of confusion about these air raids. <clears throat> Here you can see a photo of um, a Japanese bomb that was recovered from near the Townsville Harbour, near those oil tanks. The tail unit had been removed and the nose fuse made safe. This was known as a Type 98, number 25 land bomb, uh, 238 kilos, nominally a 250 kilogram bomb. 
Uh, another news clip, newspaper clipping, this time on the second air raid um, over Townsville in July 1942, where one Emily, um, W46, left Rabaul on the afternoon of the 27th of July 1942. Uh, one wireless unit at um, French Street detected radio transmissions after takeoff and provided seven hours' notice to three fighter sector headquarters. Lieutenant Kiyoshi Mizukuru was, um, came back again to Townsville and his aircraft was detected by 104 radar, RWF, at Kiss Kissing Point, one hour, 50 minutes before its arrival over Townsville. The, this time the 208th Coast Artillery Regiment Anti-Aircraft Radar at Horseshoe Bay also detected the aircraft at about 22 and a half miles out from the island and their searchlights illuminated the aircraft after the northern uh, off sorry should off the northern end of magnetic island six p39 era cobras from the eighth fighter group took off from garbutt airfield they'd been relocated from their outlying airfields to garbutt just in case there was another air raid three batteries of the 208th coast artillery regiment fired 72 rounds at heights from 14,000 feet to 15,200 feet for about a minute without effect. Two Australian heavy anti-aircraft sites also opened fire again without effect. This, this um, opening fire by these um, five batteries prevented the P-39 Era Cobras that had taken off the six Era Cobras from being able to attack the Japanese Emily um, flying boat uh, which then went on to drop eight 250 kilogram bombs um, from heights from the height of 15,000 feet at about 2:25 a.m. Uh, land and they landed on Many Peaks Range, uh, sort of to the west of uh, Palaranda. Uh, so you can see here where the uh, the bombs dropped. Um, you've got Palaranda, the township of Palaranda, or the suburb Palaranda here. Today there's a large uh, RAAF um, radar on Mount Marlow um, and Garbutt Airfields down the bottom here, about eight kilometres away. And um, officials found seven craters and one unexploded bomb um, along Many Peaks Range here north of Garbutt Airfield. Um, the Smedley family had a fishing shack less than a kilometre away from where those bombs dropped and they uh, happened to arrive on site before the military officials <coughs> and, and located the uh, unexploded bomb. Series of photos here of um, some of the craters from this second raid. Here's the first crater. Um, here's the second crater with the fellow standing inside the bomb crater. The third crater the fourth crater, don't know what happened to the fifth crater, but here's the sixth crater, and here is a piece of shrapnel re recovered from Many Peaks Range, which is now on display at the RAF uh, Heritage Centre at Garbutt. Annette Burns uh, told me that the local history collection of the Townsville Library also holds a piece of shrapnel from that bombing raid. Um, and that's Bill Wallace from the RAF Museum, as it was known then, in Townsville, holding that large piece of shrapnel. So here's a newspaper clipping about the third raid on Townsville. Um, they um, got it wrong again because they said it was carried out by a single flying boat. Um, they were in fact... Oh, well, actually, they got it right because two, two Emily flying boats did take off but one returned. Um, so W37 and W47 took off from a ball before 4pm on the 28th of July. However, one of them had to return um, to a ball about one hour later with a mechanical problem. Um, W47 arrived over Townsville at 12.27am uh, at 20,000 feet 
and four uh, P-39 Aero Cobras took off 15 minutes before the Emily was due to arrive over Townsville. And two of those P-39s were able to make six simultaneous attacks on the Emily flying boat. A brief fire was sighted in the tail of the Japanese flying boat, but it did extinguish. Um, the Japanese aircraft uh, was coned by 10 searchlights. The pilot Kinjo Shoji, Shoji S-H-O-J-I, managed to evade the searchlights and dropped eight 250 kilogram bombs. Seven of those bombs landed in Cleveland Bay between the breakwater and the southern end of Magnetic Island. One bomb landed near the Anumba Experimental Station and the radar then tracked <coughs> excuse me, W-47 for 130 kilometres out to sea. Here you can see, um, I've just, I don't know exactly where those seven bombs landed in the sea. I've just put them halfway between um, the breakwater at the Townsville Harbour and um, Picnic Bay. And one bomb uh, landed at the Anumba Experimental Station. Here you can see um, some army officials, army uh, servicemen, uh, looking for shrapnel at the crater at um, the Anumba Experimental Station. Um, and that's a photo again of that same crater. Um, you can see a coconut grove in the background there. Actually, during World War II, that coconut grove was used as a chicken farm by the US Army Quartermaster uh, to help feed the troops in the Townsville area. Um, you can see the young girl uh, standing in the crater at um, the Anumba Experimental Station. Only recently I've had it confirmed that that was Betty Partridge, knee Minahan. So she was Betty Minahan at that time. Uh, this is her, uh, sorry, this is her uncle uh, standing here uh, to the uh, right of the photo. Uh, note the camouflage on that vehicle there. And um, Betty, actually, as it turns out, is a very close f family friend of ours. We uh, visited her uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, the only damage uh, from this bombing raid was a single coconut tree at the uh, Noomba Experimental Station, um, <coughs> which you can see in these photo photos here. There's a very small plaque located beside a cycle or walking track, which is parallel to the nearby road which comes over the over Rooney's Bridge, heading out towards uh, Cluden. A bit hard to see, actually, um, but it's there. Well, it was when I was there last. Um, during one of my business trips, when I had some spare time, I met up with um, Stephen Johnson, who at that time was the manager of the Anumba Veterinary Laboratory. And he took me to the remains of uh, the bomb crater, which you can see in this photo. He took me there in his four-wheel drive. All of that land now behind uh, him is developed as housing land, and I think they were trying to preserve this crater, so, which I hope they have done. Um, the Japanese crew, when they reported back at Rabaul, uh, reported as follows: We we hit more than ten times. We were hit more than ten times by two. Hurricanes. We never had any hurricanes uh, in the Townsville area. Um, dropped three bombs near the aerodrome, um, causing three fires and five more on the city, igniting two more. So, you know, uh, the bombs landed in the sea and only one on the land, nowhere near the aerodrome and not really that close to the city. I think they told a few porkies. Um, Tokyo Rose, um, in her broadcasts on the 1st and the 2nd of August, made the following statement. All important military installations at Townsville were smashed in three raids by the Japanese naval air units. On the 25th of July, airfields, oil tanks, shipping and supply dumps were raided. On the 28th of July, oil tanks and supply dumps were attacked. And on the 29th of July, remaining military installations were bombed. This attack on Townsville was one of the heaviest since the fall of Singapore. So propaganda. 
Radio Berlin uh, reported on the 26th of August, <coughs> 42, in Townsville, which is still burning, the, <laughs> the Brisbane railway line was again bombed and made unusable over large stretches. Then again on the 6th of September, uh, 1942, the Government of Queensland has decided to evacuate Townsville, which, as is well known, has been subject to particularly violent Japanese raids. So I'm now going to talk about the three Japanese air raids um, over Townsville. So raid number one, as I said earlier, was two um, MLEs, uh, flying boats, which dropped 15 bombs in that location near the oil tanks. Raid number two dropped um, eight bombs on Many Peaks Range. And raid number three uh, dropped uh, one bomb um, at Anumba and seven bombs somewhere in the sea between Magnetic Island and Townsville Harbour. And that's the end of my talk. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that enjoyable. I'll just stop the share and stop the recording. Thank you.